Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to this session. It looks like to be in class again. This was 40 years ago for me, but it's a pleasure to be here. It's a great subject we discussed today. It's blockchain gaming. You know, about 3 billion users are experiencing uh, this game. We have an outstanding growth and interest. The market is expected to grow about 100% per year and reaching a market cap of 50 billion in 2025, according to a Bitcraft Navic report. There are several interesting uh, aspects we'll discuss today. Play to earn, play to own, in-game assets, but I hope also that play for fun still remains. <laughs> Especially play to earn is an emerging paradigm within the gaming industry and it is having an eff effects on real world economies and societies. And especially in the Philippines, many people uh, are becoming rich through play to earn. And it's a pleasure to be here with my friends, the panelists. On my left is Alex Suarez a hardcore gamer. <laughs> he started already with 17 to develop games, and he has a great passion for it. Also, when you speak with him personally, there is a lot of emotions in it. His uh, days go back to the glorious Commodore Amiga days, where he developed as a student already uh, computer games. He founded the Corex Group in 2002, and is today the CEO of Gamescom. Andrew Kester, maybe some of you know him already from the previous session. Andrew Kester is the technological brain behind Zenota. He's a co-founder. He's a South African serial entrepreneur who founded a number of uh, uh, startups focused on biometrics, logistics, and human identity. He holds also several awards like first prize winner at the ITC Inventors Garage, finalist in the Gap Innovation Competition and Seed Stars. And all on the right is Thomas Kronewig. He's Norwegian, he's the founder and CEO of Waster. I think all of you know it. He led actually the company to, to its global growth and also executed on the vision. <coughs> he's a... Uh, in his DNA, he's a salesman. Already at the age of 15, he sold uh, cell phone subscriptions to his colleagues uh, after school. And he used his expertise actually to personally build gaming communities with hundreds of active members and worked with gaming consumers for over a decade. Good. Then let me start with my first question, which, which goes to all of you. You know, out of the 3 billion users, about 50 million are blockchain gamers. What is blockchain gaming and what role does it play within the larger gaming industry? But the, but, uh, can I give this question first to you? First, Alex. okay, thanks. Yeah, first of all, hello. Um, it's great to be here. Um, so I'm not, I'm not coming from the blockchain side when I'm speaking about games. I'm going from the gaming side to the blockchain side. So what we do is um, gaming with a blockchain flavor, a flavor. So if you ask me what for me blockchain games are, um, for me blockchain gaming is giving ownership back to the user. So that's for me the most important thing about blockchain gaming. What we do not like is this. We don't like it because um, I think it's the wrong way of doing it is uh, play to earn. So we think play is for fun, so play for fun. And, and what we're doing, we're adding the ownership to it. So we call it play to own. So if you ask me, uh, blockchain gaming right now is like a niche <coughs> of 50 million people playing blockchain games. But if you compare that, for example, with uh, Candy Crush, um, with 500 million people playing it, uh, it's not real uh, a big amount of gamers. So blockchain gaming itself, makes a lot of sense because it combines things that fit together perfectly. Um, I think it will go out of the niche. It will be mass market. And to do that, you need to do different things. And that's what we're doing. So I think blockchain games are uh, the future of gaming. And I think in, in 10 years, there will be no game without blockchain integration. Thank you, Alex. You're welcome. Andrew? I'd like to think about this. Um, 
in terms of where could blockchain gaming go? Um, not really where it is right now. Um, I think the potential far outstrips the what's been realized currently. There's some interesting statistics sitting here today. I think assets under management for the entire crypto ecosystem sits, uh, I think, at about 1.3 trillion, right? And if we rewind the clock just three years, it was sitting at 260 odd billion. So we've, we've seen about a 5x growth in three years, right? And a lot of economists, um, even sort of somewhat pessimistic um, economists are, are saying that 40 trillion to 100 trillion in 10 to 15 years for um, the blockchain ecosystem is not unimaginable. And that means in 10 to 15 years, instead of going to the stock exchange, you might be going to the blockchain ecosystem, right? Um, and so we, we're trying to imagine how do you go from where we are to there? <coughs> And now this, this is going to be very sort of uh, soulless. This isn't uh, the passion of gaming and all of that. I'm, uh, that's, um, uh, uh, Thomas is very good at understanding the mind of a gamer. I'm, I'm looking at the mind of a banker, which is potentially less interesting, but here we go. Um, <laughs> that means that more money is coming from the traditional finance world into blockchain than there is money in blockchain already. <laughs> Right? So we have to build a bridge. We need to siphon, uh, we need to, 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 to link out to where everyone is and bring them across the fence into crypto. And what are some good candidates for that? Okay, so I mean, I'm gonna grab NFTs as a, as a, as a buzzword to work with. Um, there's a profile, there's PFP NFTs, uh, there's in-game NFTs, there's music NFTs, there's art NFTs, there's several ticket NFTs. Uh, which of these kind of represent uh, good asset classes <coughs> Uh, for a boring banker to think about and why. What makes markets behave uh, rationally and what makes price points evolve efficiently, one of the things, is strong competition. And a second important factor is a, a sense of, by which you can kind of securitize uh, that asset to some degree. You know, fixed immovable is always better than, than borrowing against the motorbike. Um, so with this thinking in mind, what, what is electronic competition? It's gaming. Uh, so items in games price themselves uh, in a way that traditional finance is very comfortable with in principle. Um, the game developer, not necessarily the game consumer, but the game developer um, certainly wants to be able to identify a pirated version of a game item from the authentic original. And so blockchain might in the future fulfill validation roles where the game developer can kick pirated bootleg users off the network. And so you have both this idea of securitization and this idea of efficient pricing. And that means in principle, uh, what, game, uh, what um, uh, bankers can do is they can build uh, mutual funds, they can build derivatives and ETFs off game items pretty much out the box with not a lot of reshuffling. And so all of a sudden we've turned it from um, you know, uh, fan speak into something that actually sounds pretty cool and could represent a new asset class. The, the challenge, and before I hand over to, to hear answer, sorry I'm taking up so much stage time, uh, the challenge here is that if you're gonna approach traditional finance, one of the things that they really have to worry about is risk, um, you know, risk against things like copy, theft, um, how um, uh, game developers might morph um, the economics and rules of a game and that sort of thing. And so what, what they could use as a way to collaborate is the blockchain. So the blockchain creates a data structure that bankers and gamers and players and different community members can coordinate around in order to get better value for everyone. And uh, secondly, game development, the, the cost center around game development has changed dramatically from 30, 40 years ago. Uh, the early model was, I sell you a game once off, it, it took me a certain amount of hours to build table tennis, I sell it for $600 if, if it's a really, really cool game, you buy it once off and that's it. But game development in the, in the modern space has ongoing operational cost centers behind maintaining a game. And that means game developers have to switch to revenue models, recurring revenue. And there isn't an obvious good way to do that. Is it freemium? Do I let you play a game for a bit and then I start charging you? And so how do I, how do I get kind of passive revenue coming in? Again, blockchain provides a solution for that. And that's why they go so well together. Lots of stuff there. Yeah. Um, 
I, I think I lean somewhere in between both of you. I think obviously if you're going to bring traditional finance into blockchain um, or into gaming, yes, the moment you the moment you're going to if, if if you're talking about taking up a loan and using game items as collateral, etc., of course it needs to be validated. But I think that's jumping too many steps into the future because I think we started with something very relevant, which is that right now there's only 50 million people playing blockchain games. The reality is that, you know, we saw these giant voice platforms, game developers, without me throwing a lot of big names under the bus here in front of a bunch of people and getting yelled at, go into the blockchain announcements with the metaverse, the NFTs, the crypto statements, and get this massive, massive backlash from traditional gamers. And the reality is that most of the reason that happens is that you have an audience who have no idea why is this good for me? Um, and I think in order to bridge traditional gaming, or the, the traditional gaming audience, or the next generation of gamers, and the people who actually want to play games into the world of blockchain, they need to understand, why is this good for me? What does this do? For, everyone in this room has a phone, a smartphone, right? So now I'm not going to sell you an Apple, but if I was to sell you an Apple phone, I wouldn't do that by telling you how it's built. I would do it by saying, here's the reasons why an iPhone is good for you. Here's why you will like an iPhone. This is what it does. And if you look at gaming, the biggest, you Google, anyone can Google this in the room and say, I can't trade my items on Steam. You get 50 to 100 million results. That's 10% of Steam's total lifetime account having issues with the fact that they don't own their own stuff. They can't trade it between their friends. They can't give it to their friends. You can't, if you, if you switch between accounts, you can't move them between accounts. There's a lot of inherent issues with your stuff is not yours, which is what he talks about with ownership. So what blockchain does is it solves issues that gamers have had issues with or problems that they've had issues with for the last 15 years in a way that they can understand. You can do with your stuff as you want. That being said, I do believe that play to earn already exists. I mean, streamers have done this for 10 years. Um, you have content creators, you have people making emblems and guild websites for, for different communities and guilds. People have made money on, on gaming for a long time. I think play to, play to earn so I separate between play to earn and play and earn. Because play to earn insinuates that every single person playing your game is gonna walk away with a net benefit. The only way that happens in a sustainable way is that if there's an outside source continuously pouring money into that ecosystem and without throwing the biggest blockchain game in the world under the bus here, um, if your entire system relies on it's the consumers, the players that are going to bring the money into the ecosystem, and everyone's going to walk away with a net benefit, you can all hear this, this is a Ponzi scheme. Because it means that it's the people coming in. You're reliant on new people coming in, bringing in more money, so that the people who's there can take money out. Play and earn insinuates that some people will walk away with money, while others will spend. And the key thing with gamers is they're more than happy to spend $5, $10, $100 a year, maybe even more, on gaming, as long as it gives them something of value. And that value can be an experience. It can be an item that makes you stronger. It can be an account in a game. It could be a player in FIFA. Gamers are willing to spend money as long as there is a use case for that money for them. They don't care if it's a net loss because they get something in return for it. I think, and I think this is the problem that I have with the financial banking, is that the vast majority of gamers, a whale, for the lack of a better phrase, in gaming, is $100 a year. That's a whale, or 100 to $200. But the point is, the vast majority is not going to spend $5,000, or 10, or 50. The vast majority of gamers don't have those kind of finances. So I think in order to get to a point where traditional finance will lend against that, you first need to bring in enough of the gamers to the point where there are some people that have enough assets to do that, but everybody else just enjoys playing the games. They have fun playing the games, they get value out of the games, and they see what blockchain can do for them. And I think in order to get anywhere with the, on the financial side, you have to do that journey first. That's my... Yeah, I just want to build on, on Thomas's point there. <clears throat> I couldn't agree more. And um, I think we're all in agreement. It's, it's not um, pay to earn as well. I also think is a bit of a misnomer. The, the idea here is that 
when I play a game, um, and let's say it's a, a civilizations game where I'm uh, building some settlements and I'm, I'm growing it and developing it, I'm potentially adding value to the ecosystem. So in, in, a, in, a, in a closed price-backed um, ecosystem, um, speculation is the only thing that can drive um, the needle in terms of uh, pushing the market capitalization higher. Uh, but gaming is not like that. Gaming, you, you are potentially creating content, you are creating uh, more usable land, you create, you're potentially creating items, and those items that you've created and own, you can now sell them to generate revenue. So uh, the gaming environment is, is far more akin to traditional financial and economic thinking than, than Bitcoin and blockchain is. So a lot of the early stage uh, pay-to-earn games were a Ponzi scheme. Uh, it was just a way that the guys who got in early would get out at, at some multiple. Um, but where it could go to uh, in the very near future, uh, with a bit of clever design, is that people, while playing games, as you mentioned, can create assets of value for which they redeem micropayments. And I'm going to put anything under $10 as a micropayment. You can use whatever threshold you like. And, and that is why I think we're going to struggle with a lot of the incumbent blockchains, because transaction fees and exchanges are killing are killing micropayments and are killing the trading of assets. So concomitant to all of this development, we really need to think about how do we create distributed marketplaces. There is no, in my opinion, really good distributed marketplace. I've got a dinky sword and I want three bucks for it. Like where am I gonna go post that, right? I mean, I can't do an airdrop on ICO or list with Kraken. I mean, I just wanna go and dump it somewhere and have someone pick it up. Um, and so really to, to solve this, we have to think about distributed marketplaces, which, when you feed it back into traditional crypto, is a general solution for a much broader problem. And so I think, I think gaming isn't just a use case. I pretty much think that gaming is like the canary in the coal mines. If we can get gaming to work, we can pretty much get anything else to work. Alex, how do we get to the gamers? We have only 50 million, how do we get to the 3 billion? You had some analogy with Gutenberg. Maybe you share this with yeah. the audience here. Yes, yes. So, so worldwide, uh, three billion people are playing games. So, 37 percent of the humanity is playing games. Yeah, and they're spending 200 billion US this year. So, if you divide this, it's 63 euro per gamer. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. So, so a German gamer is spending 145 euro a year, in average. Um, the thing is, we do not have to look on these 50 million um, blockchain gamers right now. So this, has, this is a niche. People who are like very good in crypto, they are af af aficionated to crypto. So, so if you look on it, you could compare it with Gutenberg. You remember Gutenberg when he invented books, yeah? You could have asked um, the book Brinkton, you could have asked, how many books will we sell so next year? And you could say, oh, let me see how many priests there are worldwide and how many people can read. And then they would like make market estimations. They'd say, okay, it could be 10,000 books a year, for example. But in reality, it turned out that because of the book, people started to to read, to learn reading. So that means uh, giving them the possibility to read made out readers out of them. And I would say it's very similar with gaming. Um, we have this whole amount of gamers and they do it for fun. They like to play, they like to invest, they like to spend money. So gamers really like to spend money. And what they're doing right now, if they want to, to, to play a, a, a blockchain game is that they have to, go to the website, then they have to uh, download the MetaMask, uh, install it in their browser, then they have to get somewhere uh, Ethereum, then they have to, so it's, it's a funnel, it's a funnel, it doesn't exist in gaming. The funnels that we have is low barriers, no barriers. So play the game in the web browser for free, without installing MetaMask, just jump in and make it. And that's what we're doing right now. So we think that the, the gamer, the blockchain gamer as they exist today, it's not the same gamer as it will exist at the end. So comparing it to Gutenberg is to say, okay, not only people that can read will buy books, also many other people who cannot read yet will buy books. And if you compare that, you could say, Every gamer in the world, this 37% of the humanity, is a possible blockchain gamer. And it will be like that because the, the benefit for them is so good. The first time they will earn what they are playing. So they're investing time 
and money in free-to-play games. You have to know that 85% of all spendings in the gaming space is free-to-play. 85%, yes. So, and then you add own it. So instead of going to a shady, or to eBay and sell the sword, then in the game drop it to someone, and you, that's that happening with World of Warcraft and so on. Instead of doing that, we're building uh, uh, distributed uh, uh, marketplaces that that encourage the gamer to to sell what they have. Okay, so that, that's very important. But if you look on, it's not play to earn, and maybe it's play and earn. But another example, let's say um, you're playing as a kid with Lego. Yeah, okay, you, you buy the Lego, you play for fun, you own it. Of course, it's in your room. You own the Legos. And then when you make your, uh, let's say you need money when you're 18 and you think, oh, this Lego, I can sell it. Now you own it and you can sell it. And if it's Lego Star Wars, maybe it's 10 times more worth than when you bought it. And that's exactly what will happen, what we think will happen to blockchain gaming. So it's, it's combining blockchain and gaming. And of course, we have this very special blockchain games today, but it will, change. It will be like natural to own everything that you have in the games. Well, thank you, Alex. This brings me to the next question. We heard about intergame currency, in-game items, ownership. How can I make sure I own this sword, I own this helmet? How should this be solved? Andrew, can, can I give that to you? Well, as a CTO, for me, that's a softball. Um, so if you were here at the previous talk, I'll, I'll just sort of recap it, what we were discussing there briefly, and then add some more substance to it. Um, you can either own things under property law, you can own things under intellectual property law, and you can own things under trademark and copyright. And so, you know, one of the things, one of the, the biggest problem with a smart contract is where is the smart law? <laughs> right. So, I mean, without a legal framework to interpret a contract, I mean, what do you really have? So that's, that's, a, that's a challenge we take very seriously. Um, and so we've, we've defined a private body of law that's soluble with uh, national law. Um, and uh, here's, here's, here's a fun, this is going a little bit more deep down that rabbit hole, and this is a really cool thing. Uh, some laws naturally harmonize globally. So if you look at trade law and trade compliance, it doesn't matter where you are, if you're in America or Switzerland, or it's more or less the same because we want to trade. What's weird is property ownership as a concept has not harmonized in pretty much any country and probably never will because ownership is so tied to politics. So when you tell me that you own something in China or you own something in America, we're not talking about the same legal construction, right? Now, if you're gonna take games which are inherently uh, multinational, how do you construct legal thinking such that my claim to something in China is equally strong as my claim to something in America? That's really hard to do, right? So uh, we found the solution by realizing there was no solution, okay? And that's very freeing, okay? And once we realized there was no solution, we thought, well, what could, what could we do about it? And the, the, the legal idea is to say, if something bizarre happens legally for the first time, often what a judge will try and do is say, okay, what is the closest thing I have in my rule book by which to judge this odd thing over here, okay? And so what we realized is if we give um, uh, owners of digital assets in Zenata 10 rights, when a judge is forced to say, what do these 10 rights most closely represent, he's forced to come to the conclusion that this represents ownership and ownership of property. Um, so by understanding that uh, when I give you a Bitcoin, I'm only really transferring one right, and that's the right to unspend. But there's a whole bunch of extra rights that you actually need to technically and legally enforce. And you give people a bundle of rights. When you make judgments on bundle of rights, you award ownership or something that's legally equivalent to ownership. So just, just to let you know, it's a very, very complicated issue. Um, but that, that opens up a very weird thing for, for gaming. If I'm a game developer and I give you all 10 rights from me to you for an item. And then I go and I change the, the politics of the game or the landscape. I could be charged of expropriating your land. If I'm giving you the right to, to value and then I devalue the land economy within my game, uh, from a legal position, I've committed a crime. So this is kind of a weird thing, but the, the day a, a game developer on Zonata promises 
not to expropriate land or assets, and then does, and a judge rules in favor, is the day that Zonotas won. In other words, we want to concretize, ownership is a fluffy thing, what is it, right? We want to concretize that. Um, tie it to files and transfer it meaningfully to, to people that can own it. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a very, very uh, deep and powerful thing, and that's why um, uh, play to earn, or play and earn, um, or play and own, is an agreement between the game developer and the game player, and the agreement reads as follows. I will give you ownership and I will transfer real value, real rights, real experiences to you, and you say, in that case, I will partake in this game. It's more equitable, it's a more fair uh, engagement. Listening to Andrew Thomas, what do you think, what type of games are most suited to blockchain-based gaming? I think the vast majority of games are, are most suited for, for blockchain gaming. Um, I don't think that you can narrow it down that way. I think the, I think it's there's a completely separate challenge, which kind of goes back to the first question you had for, for Alex, which is how do you get people to... So let's say you want to try a blockchain game. Where do you go? Where do you find the right game for you? Or, you, or a sports game or a shooter, or whatever type of game that it is that you want. In an industry that is growing as quickly as this is, with as many consumers as it is, how the... Can I curse on stage? I'm guessing not. Uh, like, how the heck do you find the, the right? It's like walking into a mall, the biggest mall on the planet. There is no front desk, no screen, no anything uh, telling you which store, where the different stores are. And not only that, there is no sign on the store saying what it is. So you actually have to walk in and test everything and then walk out and go into the next to find. So. I think when you want people to find blockchain games or any other games, what you need is you need something, and obviously that's what we've built. I mean, we're a social platform, but you need a place where it's easy for you as a, as a consumer to go in and say, here's who I am, here's what I want, here's what I like, what's the right for me? And then you get that guidance, because then I can guide those that are still in the Web 2 space, but curious and might be willing to play a blockchain game, I can guide them towards that by figuring out this type of game would fit them. Because as he pointed out, there's a lot of games where it's just like, it's, it's not a game I would play. The question is, how do you get, for example, a browser game? If you want to take the people who's on mobile, you're not going to get them to do a browser game. What you're going to get them to do is a mobile game. If you're a browser gamer, you're not going to get them to play a mobile game. You need to figure out how do you guide them to the right place so that they can interact with this in the first place. Then comes all the ownership stuff and those things, again, into play afterwards. Because I agree, the, the, what you do get in return for, for, you know, for being on blockchain is that I own this. This is my experience. This is mine. But even more so, and I think this is where the play, I actually believe there can be a sustainable play to earn. Because what value, what people forget is that the, the thing you do when you, when you play games or you do anything on social media in any way, shape, or form, is that you generate something. You generate data which is valuable. It is valuable to him because he wants to know who is the right consumer for the game I just made. That is data he needs and you're making it. So. What if someone went to someone like that and say, are you willing to pay for this data? Well, then you have an external source willing to put money in because he's getting something valuable out, which means that there is now there is a financial asset there that you can then distribute to the actual players. So you have a real play to earn. It's just that the developers need to find new revenue models based on the fact that you now have blockchain there. So I, I think play to earn can work under those circumstances. Under the existing ones, I think it's, it's play and earn where majority of players puts money in and some take the money out. And then once you've solved all these things, then you need to solve the ownership parts, you need to solve regulation, you need to solve compliance. There's a, because now you're giving people value and there's a bunch of extra annoying stuff that comes with that. I, I'd just like to sort of close off, um, um, going back to your question, Herbert. A lot of the early games that we saw coming out into the blockchain space were kind of card-based or collectible-based games. Um, and that, that, was, that was just because nothing focuses the mind like a lack of, uh, of option. Right? That's all you could do, and so that's what came out, right? Um, but if you look at what a natural fit is, 
um, games where users can generate content uh, is a much better fit for um, blockchain-based gaming and where there is more than one player, <laughs> right? So who's gonna put Solitaire on the blockchain? So that's, that's an automatic non-starter. But both of these carry uh, technical challenges that need to be solved. Um, if you're playing an MMORPG, uh, does your blockchain network have the throughput uh, and latency um, characteristics to handle 600,000 simultaneous connections with a near real-time economy? Um, because a lot of what you're talking about is user experience. Um, I don't want to have, and to your point as well, I don't have to pause, go to my MetaMask, see if the assets come in, quickly download a plug, it's not going to work, right? And so if we move to um, uh, user-generated content, uh, you're definitely going to have to move. At the moment, a lot of game items are kind of procedurally generated. It's a short phrase, that the, it's a short piece of code that the game then generates into a sword. But if I'm gonna skin that sword or add my content to the sword, the blockchain now needs to be aware of my JPEG that I used as a skin or whatever it is. So supporting user-based content and supporting multiple connections, um, those are really, really good use cases if the technology can handle it. I'm not entirely sure I would agree. Uh, so yes, I agree where players can generate content is absolutely a use case. But from my end, I would connect it to time. So I would almost go as far as to say that an MMORPG type of game is is a significantly better experience, a better example for or potential use case for this type of this type of tech and ownership because in MMORPGs they in by nature you spend so much time achieving goals, working with others to achieve stuff that very often what happens is that you will get something that whether it's a piece of equipment or a weapon or a house or something that you've spent a lot of time and effort achieving and being able to use or acquiring which will have an inherent value to you, and very often that gives you a benefit. And not just being able to create content, but you actually have an actual benefit of having this raid drop or whatever, which means that someone else will most likely be willing to pay for it. And, and you can also drag this one step further and say, what if the actual login itself is an NFT on, on its own, so that what you use to log in is an NFT, which means that now technically you can sell your account. I mean, I sold my, my Black Desert Online account for like $18,000 through one of these, you sell the actual login, which means you need to switch emails and all that stuff to disconnect it from, an NFT would solve this and it would actually provide a framework where you're actually allowed to do this, because this is something that most games today try to avoid. And you can rent your accounts. Yep. So one, one important thing about that is, so imagine being Blizzard and having World of Warcraft. You're not interested into changing your business model. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so right now, uh, uh, they forbid it. It's forbidden to transfer anything, anything of all. So this is a chance for new coming gaming companies because they do not have to, to comply with all this business model that they have. So you have to see the following. Traditional companies in the in the gaming space, like Ubisoft, for example, Ubisoft, uh, they are stick to their business model because they're very successful. They are getting so much money out of the gamers already. And now these companies like Ubisoft come and tell the players, hey, yeah, now you can also spend even more money with an NFT. So what happens is that the gamers, they say, oh, yeah, we don't like NFTs. Why not? Because it costs money. They have already paid subscription, microtransactions, premium, blah, 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 blah. They're not allowed to do anything, and now they should buy NFT. And that's the reason why the traditional gaming companies have it very hard to succeed in the blockchain space. And on the other side, the blockchain games company, companies often do not understand how games are built. Because they, they, these are like copycats. So you, you, you remember uh, CryptoKitties in 2017, and then it was with cats, okay, CryptoKitties, then with, do with dogs, with fishes, with blah, 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 a lot of, so then the, the collectible card game is the same. So, so every time a new blockchain game comes out, you get like 100 copycats <laughs> coming out also, yes? And, and, um, and this connection is funny because it's a, it's a non-connection of both industries right now. So, so the companies who understand how games are done and now add the ownership that's how they will succeed, yeah. I, I agree, but the, the interesting question that, or the, the interesting thing there is you're mentioning business models, and, and you're right, I mean, Ubisoft, EA, uh, which I used to be at, uh, none of these companies want these traditional, or these new business models because 
the reality is that the less ownership you have of your stuff, the more they can monetize you. If you can't trade your items, if I get done playing a game, I, and you're my friend, I'd like to just hand my stuff over to you and now you can have that benefit that it, because I moved on to a new game. This will take away their ability to now profit off of you buying this stuff, hence why they don't want it. But the reality is that eventually they're gonna wake, wake up and say, shit, we can make more money going the other way around because by making a game where it might be free, you free entry, you can, you can start playing it for free, you can start earning items, if those items are an NFT, you can literally just pro program in a, a royalty cut so that every time he sells it, now you have a recurring revenue as a publisher. Like there, there are tons of amazing opportunities for you as a game developer if you are, but the reality is that they, and they will wake up to, to that because a recurring, recurring royalty revenue, the consumers are happy because they own their own stuff, is going to make you significantly more money than forcing them to not be able to do anything with what they have. But so it will change, but but you're right. It's because they're, the business models are, they don't want to change at the moment. It's really hard to change your business model. So <laughs> if you're monetizing on one business model, you can't switch, it's, it's not possible. You cannot do that. So you need to make new IPs, new games, and game uh, traditional game publishers and developers do not like risk. So why is there FIFA 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Speed Need for Sphere, Speed, you know, everything are IPs that are building up and building up and building up and building up. So now change the business model. So now start changing. That's not, po it's very, very hard. And one thing is the, the gamers do not care. Gamers do not care about blockchain. So we have 37% of the world population playing games and a few percent only owning, owning blockchain items, yes. And they don't care, so, so that means that you have to do games in a way they don't have to care. So they, all, they should do what they like to do, play for fun, and then you add some small steps, some additional benefits, and, you, and then there is the other thing, we were speaking about blockchain the whole time, that's the, uh, this whole uh, metaverse uh, 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 hype right now, yes? Uh, so most of the games are metaverses. That's what we forget. Most of the games already are metaverses. Now, okay, companies change their name to Meta, for example, or other companies uh, spend a lot of money to buy uh, big, big publishers like Activision, so that was the biggest acquisition from Microsoft ever done. Why? To buy something in the metaverse, yes? So, so I think when, when companies wake up now in the gaming space, it will be maybe too late for them to wake up. And the question is, if which company in the gaming space will be succeeding, the one with the more money or the other one with the best economy behind it and the best mechanics? This brings me actually to the last question. We are running out of time. I don't want to keep the students longer here. <laughs> uh, you heard actually there are many, many challenges. Centralized versus decentralized. Centralization actually brought Vitalik to write his white paper. He was also here in Zug. And NFTs, then play to earn. And I like to ask all three of what are you most excited about by blockchain gaming going forward? What keeps you really motivated with these challenges? So for, for me, it's a, it's a subtle point, uh, and it's, it's actually a perfect follow-on from the previous comments. I get to I get to answer that question as well. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have studied economics or, or who's coming from law coding, so this is an annoying recap, I apologize. A zero-sum game is, is got nothing, so game theory's got nothing to do with games. Uh, it's, a, it's a branch of economics that look at how do people make decisions. And in a zero-sum game, there's a winner and a loser, right? And in a non-zero-sum game, it doesn't guarantee that, that we will both win. It just means that we have to play collaboratively. We, our fates are correlated. We are either all gonna succeed or we're gonna drown together, right? And I think a lot of the, the revenue models and game constructions that are out there, um, as far as the game producer is concerned, they're very much looking at the market as they're playing a zero-sum game. You're either an EA Sports fan and you're in our fold and we win and we get revenue, or we lose you to somebody else. I think the day that uh, the, the, the blockchain ecosystem can communicate with traditional gaming platforms and say, what, what, what happens to the gaming economy when we move from zero-sum game mechanics to non-zero-sum game mechanics? What if I could take my uh, football jersey out of EA games on the blockchain, take that same digital item and inject it into a new game environment, 
as long as these two game publishers collaborate and I get a similar experience, that creates something uh, that you can't put a price tag on, branding. Branding is not corporate identity, it's not the logo on your shirt. The term branding comes from literally branding cattle. So, so farmers would have a weird symbol that they would brand their cattle with, and people psychologically associated the, the, the beef with the funny double Z, that's the good beef. That's the value I get. It tastes so much better than the beef with the weird plus sign on it. And that's what a brand is. It's that, uh, that's that sense of getting a quality product, of being looked after. It's all that warm, fuzzy things that turn you from a client into a customer. So if you adopt uh, the blockchain collaborative approach, this, this is what gets me excited about the future, the potential. You stop playing zero-sum mechanics with your consumer and you switch to non-zero-sum mechanics where we all benefit collaboratively as an ecosystem. We're all gonna make a ton of money. We're all gonna have a fantastic experience and we're gonna see value for the first time. Thank you. I actually fall somewhere along the, si somewhere along the same lines. Um, I mean, we, I started Waster because I wanted to have I wanted to drive positive change on, on people's lives through gaming. Um, and I think the interesting part is that, for me, being a gamer was an identity. But the generation after us now, I mean, gaming is in everything we do. It's a part of culture. It's a part of how we express, express ourselves. It's how we tell stories. It's how we experience relationships. All of this happens through game mechanics, it's, whether it's board games in a room with your family to meeting someone online and building a, a connection and a friendship. And I think branding is, is incredibly important. You've, if you've seen any of my interviews anywhere, it's, I always talk about that we are gonna be the biggest gaming lifestyle brand, lifestyle brand on the planet. And that's the thing, the new generation, for them playing games is a part of their life. It's a part of their, the way they live it. And I think what blockchain can do is that it can, it can improve the, peop the quality of people's life by by, by simplifying it, by giving you easy access to bringing with you the things that you that matter to you, whether it's in between different games or the ability to share it with your friends or the ability to use the things you earn to express yourself, to have fun. Imagine, imagine that you, and now I'm gonna use Wasser as an example, but that's not actually, imagine we partnered around a game and we theme something inside of our in, inside of our ecosystem so that if a user talks about you, if someone talks about one of your games or invites one of their friends, they get something cool. They can use that as part of how they express themselves in the social environment of what we do, but they can also use it in your game. And then later on, they can have some sort of profit or experience that they walk away with at the end of it. The technology for me is that it, this isn't about t teaching people about the tech. It's about letting the tech make your life simpler, better, more fun, more enjoyable, and give you more control of it. It is, it, it is, tech allows you to do those things as long as you come from the perspective of adding value as the currency of the future. And, and that's what you need to do to, to everyone who engage with you. <laughs> so, um, so there are things that, are things that are some things are digital, more fun than in real life, yes? So, but not a lot of them. And one of them is gaming. So if, if you give to your kids something to play, they will play with it. But the first time they grab your phone and they start playing a digital game, they will not stop. So that means there are few things in life that are better digital than real. And that's sometimes when my kids are playing too much, then it's not nice, yeah? But Let's see the thing. So, okay, gaming is more fun digital. It's the first thing. It was missing. What was missing for that till now? It was the blockchain technology to have the digital ownership because gaming is not so old. So, so the digital gaming is not so old. It began like 1970s, something like that. So, around my age. And in this time, it has changed from pixels to now immersive experiences. But the fun thing is that. Playing digital is more fun than playing a board game. That's a pity, but it's true. So, and it's happening because we have this three billion gamers proving it. And what was missing till a few years was the ownership of these digital things. Because when things get digital, we have lost ownership. And blockchain is bringing it back again. So that's, I think, 
that will be the next generation of games, always being able to own everything and keeping it digital. So I would say it from a very, very bird view, like, like I told it now. And I think the, the most important thing is that if you look now on the gaming space and you look now again in, in five years or 10 years through the digitalization of everything and also in work and so on, you will see that, that more people are spending more money because they feel like it's an investment because that now they, they own this and it's not a waste of money. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for coming here. <laughs> There will be plenty of time at happy hours to talk with the gentlemen. Wish you a great continuation of the afternoon. Thank you.